I think anyone that collects records and digs, like, you get that, that kind of radar, you know, you get that, like, there are records here somewhere, you know, you just get this vibe that for some reason there are going to be records wherever you are and you kind of somehow manage to sniff them out in some kind of weird backstreet market that you, you know, it's like a spices stall or whatever and you somehow manage to find they've got like a box of 45s in the back for whatever reason. Hey, what's up? This is Spin Doctor, London's own, The Doctor's Orders, and you're tuned in to Crate Diggers. Well, I'm the youngest of six kids, so I was always surrounded by my elder brothers and sisters' music. My brother was into like the more classic rock stuff, like the Stones and Led Zeppelin and that kind of stuff. So I always listen to that because you always kind of look up to your older brother. And then the real changer is when my sister brought home a copy of License to Ill by the Beastie Boys, and I was just like, what the like just totally switched it up after that i just kind of started searching for hip-hop to try and find more you know like pouring over sleeve notes and credits and labels and stuff like that to try and figure out more of what this what this music was so by the time i was finishing school i was always the guy that would play the records at the school party this is like before i had turntables like literally sitting with a stack system and playing like one track off a tape and then putting the record on and you know flicking the system over and playing the next one off the record and then the next one off the cd this is um a jackson five talk and sing personally to valentine readers flexi disc that came out in mid 70s um attached to a uk magazine called valentine magazine it's just really cool. It's like the Jackson Five, like chatting to the readers of Valentine and, and singing snippets of their songs and stuff like that. It's just like a cool little piece. I genuinely don't know how rare it is, but it's just one of those like weird, quirky little things that set, you know, one person's record collection apart from someone else's. So I thought I would show it to you crate digging nerds. <laughs> When I was at university, I was lucky enough to get a job at a place called Reckless Records. They've got a store that's really close to where I live now and where I grew up. Once I got a job there, like my collection and my knowledge swelled very quickly. The joy of it was that you were just coming in contact with like, you know, new secondhand music. This is something I picked up while I was working at Reckless Records many years ago. This is the heart-shaped uh, Bobby Caldwell, What You Won't Do For Love. It's a great record and really nicely done. This is like one of my favorite tunes of all time. I'm like a huge Bobby Caldwell fan anyway, but just a great record, really nicely packaged and released. And probably like, if I had to get rid of all the other records, this would be certainly one of the last ones to go. It just holds a real place in my heart, not only for what the music is, but also for that period of my life of working in Reckless and being turned on to music that I wasn't necessarily aware of until then. But the other joy of secondhand record shops is just the weird that you come across and the weird people that you meet, you know. The junkies that have found a Cliff Richard record on the street and are trying to sell it to you for a hundred quid so they can get their next fix or whatever else. But the one particular story that always sticks in my mind was the guy that brought the record into the shop and uh, as you pulled like the record out to like, you know, check the condition of it, these Polaroids fell out on the floor. So I picked them up and it was basically this series of 10 Polaroids that this guy had clearly taken himself of being given by this girl basically so it was like the whole series from like him unzipping to him like essentially on this girl's face from like start to finish in this series of 10 polaroids i wouldn't say it's an obsession it's certainly an admission um that i collect any records with uh lewd and pornographic and explicit record covers from things like Eric Delancey goes skin deep um, to 
mood music for love making for adults only you know people wouldn't get away with making records like this anymore i used to do a lot of uh digging in boot fairs and stuff like that and on less successful days you wouldn't necessarily find um records that you wanted but you'd always be guaranteed to find at least one record with a pair of boobs on it so in order for me not to come home empty-handed and feeling like i'd got up at seven in the morning to stand in the rain for no reason i'd always buy the record with the boobs on it so i felt like i'd come home with at least something this guy fausto papetti who has done loads and loads of records and they are literally all with different levels of erotica this one's great with the car driving up the girl's boob you know etc etc there is a record shop in barcelona that actually has like a little section in the racks, like sectioned off from all the other records of, I think he's just labeled it like porno or something like that. And it's just all of like erotic record covers. And I'd been there a couple of times and I bought pretty much the whole kind of porno section of this record shop. And then the last time I went to this record shop, I was with my uh, my now fiance, she was my girlfriend at the time and rather embarrassingly as we walked into the record shop the guy recognized me straight away and was like hey porno guy like this it's much to the embarrassment of my girlfriend at the time I you know make fairly regular trips to New York and always make sure I go to uh, A1 Records and Pete Rock comes in and you know, me being the geek that I am, I was like, oh, shit, rock, rock, rock. I didn't talk to him or nothing because I don't know the guy and I didn't want to like be all up in his face. So I'm just flicking through the racks and Pete's doing the same. And you know, he's pulled out a bunch of records and he's gone over to the counter to pay for the records. And he's suddenly all like, oh, I can't find my wallet. You know, or maybe I've left it in the car and he goes and has a look in the car and comes back and he's all like, oh yeah, I don't know what I've done with it. And I don't know why, like the impression I got off him and the way that the guy that was serving him was acting towards him. I got the vibe that they were like, yeah, yeah, OK, whatever. And felt like Pete was trying to get the records on credit and, you know, it would be like, oh, you know, you know, I'm good for them. I'll be back later kind of thing. But this was all going on in the shop while I was still just flicking through the records and whatever. And then a whole bunch of them like flick forward together. And I noticed at the bottom of this rack is this wallet and so I pick it up and I have a look and it's got Pete Rock's driving license and whatever else and, and he's still here at the counter. So there was this split second of like, do I just, you know, do I take Pete Rock's wallet so I can be like, hey, look what I got. So, you know, bragging rights when I get home. But, you know, I did the right thing and I went over and gave Pete his wallet back and he paid for the records and everything was good. But there was that split second, you know, I'm not a criminal admittedly, but there was that split second of like, oh, maybe I should just keep it. One of my things that I'm getting obsessive about at the moment is cover versions and I've started like a series of cover version mixtapes and this has an electro electronic like Moog version of Give It Up, Turn It Loose, James Brown, Beatles covers of Obladi, Oblada and Blackbird. Another cover version of Aquarius, like we need that cover of Green Onions, it's like all covers and it looks great. Give it up, turn it loose is like the interesting one for me. This was a present from um, DJ Mr. Thing, my very close friend. It is by Key of Dreams. And this is the dub mix of a cover version of Africa by Toto, which anyone who DJs with me regularly or, or hears me play out, that's like my guilty pleasure record. It's not even a guilty pleasure. I'm not ashamed to admit it. Like I love Africa by Toto. Um, I get ribbed for it mercilessly by the guys that we DJ with regularly. They all like, oh, not this again as I'm there, like shocking out. It's not very good, but you know, to me, it's very special because it's a cover version, which I love. It's a cover version of <laughs> Africa by Toto, which I love. It's on baby records. I'm soon to be a dad. And it's from my boy, Mr. Thing, who I also love. So, you know, what's not to love? <laughs> You know, I wake up every day and I'm very grateful of the fact that I make a living doing something that I'm passionate about. To me, the most special thing uh, through the parties I've done over the years 
is the relationship I've built up with Marduk's Dilla's mum. Uh, we throw an annual tribute party in London and we've started to do the same in Manchester and Bristol and Brighton and other UK cities. Each year I bring Marduk's over to come to the parties and, you know, show her how much love Dilla has in the UK. But to now have this friendship of like pure love and mutual respect with his mum, who's just the sweetest woman you could ever hope to meet, is to me, you know, something really special. This is the single that came off the Sweet For My Dukes, not super rare and relatively recent, um, but just made more special to me by the fact that My Dukes signed it to me personally a couple of years ago. The project itself, the Sweet For My Dukes thing, I am like a huge fan of. I just thought it was incredible what they did with that, uh, Miguel, Antwood Ferguson and them. And it is something that I am going to try and bring to the UK at some point, um, try and get them to recreate it, I hope. Uh, so watch this space and much love and respect to my Dukes. And the things I get like most excited about is the discovery of new music and stuff that I'm not yet aware of and you know whether it's a band or a particular LP that, that they did or you know whatever it might be just new music in total that I'm suddenly like oh what the f is that you know that's the excitement to me of same thing as when I was first getting into music with my sister brought home license to ill or when I was you know first going to nightclubs and hearing DJs play particular records and being bugging out like was that record or hearing it on you know the radio and having to try and remember what it was that buzz and that spark of like excitement and interest that kind of feeling is the holy grail as it were rather than like you know an actual record that i'm already aware of i think you know if there was something that i was desperate to have it's probably something that i haven't heard yet the little scratches the pops you know it's all part of the character of that record that you know you're unfortunate enough sometimes you remember oh, when I made that scratch and I can still hear it you know all of them kind of seem to carry more of a story with them to some extent. Mm -hmm. 